fixing my eyebrow cause it always sticks up. Sup y'all, Anthony Fantano here, the internet's busiest music nerd. And it's time for yet another review of an older album, a vintage album, an aged album, King Crimson, in the court of the Crimson King. King Crimson is an ever-evolving and changing progressive rock band hailing from the UK, whose only real consistent member over the course of King Crimson's many phases has been guitarist and keyboardist Robert Fripp. However, that is not to underplay the role taken by other musicians in the group at this time, or really at any time in King Crimson, because as the band's roster changed, so did their music. I mean, the group would sometimes alter its lineup midway through the year in addition to gaining or losing a member pretty much every single year since the release of In the Court of the Crimson King until the band's very first hiatus in 1970. And the band did make really good and worthwhile music after that hiatus, for sure. But this album represents really a golden age for King Crimson, coming before the extremely experimental and indulgent Lark's Tongues and Aspic, and the slightly more New Wave influence Discipline. I would actually go as far as to say this album pretty much represents the starting of a golden age for progressive rock in general. However, in 1969 when this album dropped, King Crimson was not the only rock group trying to advance rock music. Before King Crimson had put Put together this full-length LP, we had releases from Soft Machine, Jethro Tull, Moody Blues, of course Zappa was already releasing music, Can and the debut Yes album actually preceded this LP by a few months as well. In this particular version of King Crimson's lineup, you have Robert Fripp on guitar, you have Michael Giles on drums, Greg Lake on bass and vocals, Peter Seinfeld doing the lyrics, and Ian McDonald really coming through as a multi the instrumentalist on this thing with vibraphone, saxophone, flute, among other things. Also, how can we forget the Mellotron? And the five tracks that this LP has to offer are an awesome musical journey. And I know that sounds really cliche, but I do wholeheartedly mean that. The band starts with nothing but feverish riffs and some insane drum fills on the opening track 21st Century Schizoid Man. It's a no-holds-barred opener with some extremely just, oh, escalating and exciting saxophone leads. <laughs> the catchy distorted vocals on the hook. It is a really heavy track. And from there we move to the balladry and, and flute harmonies of I Talk to the Wind, toning things down a lot more, but, but still very detailed, beautiful, inspiring. While this tune is still very much a rock song, the melodies and the chords being played feel so folky in a way. I mean, the, it, it's just archaic, kind of, in a sense. It's like I'm hearing this old music from a completely different world or something like that. The melody is, is absolutely intoxicating, and even though this is a quieter song, the drums still very, very detailed and kind of improvisational against the song, but still not really impeding upon the beauty of it, enhancing it. And the flute solo on this thing is, is great. And from there, we move to the extremely just dark, middle piece of this album, Epitaph. It is a Mellotron-kissed dirge that really helped associate this instrument with progressive rock and King Crimson in general. They went on to use this instrument many, many, many times on subsequent albums. And the band's Yes, Rush, Alan Parsons Project, and many, many more would write some really powerful music with it as well. And if you can, look into how the Mellotron worked. I mean, this keyboard instrument was an extremely important piece of technology for its time because it was kind of playing t tones that were essentially samples, but it's got kind of like a grainy quality to it that, that feels familiar, like I'm hearing an orchestra or something like that, but it's also very haunting. King Crimson definitely shoots for something sort of orchestral at the beginning of this track with some big drum rolls, a lot of reverb, and when the song finally kicks in, it is just absolute drama being filtered through this rock music lens. The guitar chords on this thing are just like breathtaking, whether it's the hugely strummed acoustic guitar chords that just 
call out with echo again and again and again, along with some very, very, I'll use the word again, dramatic arpeggiated guitar chords. And they slowly build the track higher and higher and higher, not just instrumentally, but emotionally. I mean, this song just feels like death to me. Every single crescendo the band brings on has this intense wave of sadness to it that I think very few artists ever have bottled into a piece of music this well. The track is just an absolute funeral dirge, especially during the, the last minute and 47 seconds of this thing, where the music gets incredibly, incredibly heavy with the drums and the mellotron. The track Moonchild, which comes right after, is equally as effective. The track starts off with all these mournful guitar leads and eventually goes into some very somber guitar chords and keyboards. And while it is a very pretty tune, I I love the vocal melody on this track. The band quickly kind of evolves into this very sort of quiet, understated, and, and very spacious improv session where you're hearing nothing but keys, drums, guitars, and, and later some vibraphone. Everybody is making sound, but nobody wants to step on one another. And you're hearing the instruments interact in a lot of ways throughout this track. Somebody will play within a certain key or play a certain rhythm and another instrument will react to that. And they're not afraid to totally interrupt and break this very intimate improvisational session apart with the opening chords of the closing track on here in the Court of the Crimson King, which if the song Epitaph was like, you know, the death of a single person and it was like the funeral for that person, this track is <laughs> the apocalypse. And musically and melodically, I feel like this track is a lot like Epitaph in, in a way. It's kind of like the reprise in this very theatrical prog rock masterpiece. It's really heavier than any other song on the album with these long, slow, drawn-out chorus vocals in the court of the Crimson King and the drums are going crazy. Just some of the best drum fills in progressive rock ever being laid out all over this track. And the crescendos on this track get heavy, heavy, heavy as well, especially when these harmonized guitar leads come in. And, and, and I mean, the album really ends as, as strong as it started. And it's funny, I feel like I should have more to say about this album, but I simply don't because there isn't a ton of material on it. It is under 50 minutes, which is sort of short by today's progressive rock standards considering just how much uh, ability and technology the genre has gained since the late 60s. However, that's that's definitely not to shortchange this album. I mean, this album is a beautiful starting point for anybody trying to get into this genre. I mean, it's an essential starting point. And it's because of the haunting and sometimes abstract lyrics. It's because of the extremely masterful, masterful masterful playing. It's because of the longer song lengths where you see a group of very experienced musicians drawing tracks out with not only great solos but very cohesive improvisations. I mean, the first track on this thing alone makes it an essential listen for any rock fan in general, much less a prog rock fan. And while I feel like a lot of new modern music listeners today may sort of roll their eyes at an album that even thinks about being this indulgent, I say to you, listen with a slightly more open mind, and I think that you'll just get a lot of joy out of how well these guys play together, because the technicality and the finesse that Fripp and Company bring to their instruments enhance the songwriting on, on this LP, not distract from it. It's not like you're hearing verse, chorus, 12 minute guitar solo. The really great playing is peppered throughout the songs in a really tasteful, engaging way. Personally, that's where I feel like a lot of modern progressive rock groups kind of miss the mark. The clean playing, the technicality, the high quality production is most certainly there, but they forget to engage the listener on this extremely artful and, and deeply emotional level too, which to me is, is the thing King Crimson does best on this album, especially with tracks like Epitaph. So if you've given this LP a listen, what did you think of it? Did you love it? Did you hate it? Why? Anthony Fantano, Classics Week, King Crimson, Forever.